Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, and welcome to today's seminar. Uh, one of the benefits of hosting this virtual seminar is that we can have people from outside our institution join us. And I think that's certainly the case today. So welcome. Um, my name is Allison Gemmel and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health. And today's seminar is brought to you by the Maternal, Fetal and Perinatal Health area of interest in our department. Um, we're really excited to have our two speakers join us here from, the, um, from UCSF. Um, and they're gonna talk about a critical and timely public health topic on COVID and pregnancy. Um, so our first speaker, Dr. Laura Jalief Pulowski is a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics in the UCSF School of Medicine and is the director of precision health and discovery with the UCSF California Preterm Birth Initiative. She serves as the primary investigator for the HOPE COVID-19 study, which examines the impact of COVID-19 and pandemic related hardship on adverse pregnancy and infant outcomes. And when she's not studying COVID, uh, Dr. Jalief Plowski is also a primary investigator of the PROMP study, which looks at metabolic predictors of newborn maturity, mortality, and morbidity. And she also holds patents for blood tests and algorithms predicting preterm birth. So our second speaker, Dr. Deborah Karasek, is a close collaborator and colleague of mine. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences and researcher with the California Preterm Birth Initiative at, also at UCSF. Um, and as a social epidemiologist, her work investigates how structural contexts shape health over the lifespan and how to target policy solutions to improve birth equity. In addition to studying the impacts of COVID-19 um, on, on infections on pregnancy, uh, Dr. Karasek is a co-principal investigator of the evaluation of the Abundant Birth Project, which is a novel pregnancy guaranteed income pilot program in the city of San Francisco. Um, so without further ado, thanks to both of you for joining us and take it away. Great, thanks so much. Let's see how I do. By now we should all remember how to, how to work Zoom. So thank you so much everybody for um, having us. It's a real pleasure. I, I love that part of the country. I kind of wish we were there, but it is nice to be able to connect with people from afar. So over the next hour or so, a little less than an hour, we, we wanted to identify some potential sort of learning objectives for the group. And I've put, you know, introductory at the front because uh, I think more now than ever before, um, when we give these kind of presentations, we have to realize that the bar is, is moving, everything is changing. So uh, we're going to give you what we, we know as of yesterday, recognizing that there might have been 10 additional papers published this morning. Um, that's really the nature of COVID-19. In fact, for those that um, don't know, uh, there's been more than 180 thousand papers on COVID-19 published, just listed in, in PubMed. So that's just uh, what's on PubMed and more than 4,000 published specifically on pregnancy and COVID-19. Um, so we're hoping that we, we can um, leave you with some information around how COVID affects pregnant people differently than non-pregnant people. Uh, what's the relationship with, between COVID-19 inf infection and adverse outcomes? Um, someone, what we know around race and ethnic and socioeconomic inequities, um, a little bit on sort of um, the issue of vaccination and this idea of meeting people where they're at, and, we'll, and Deb will talk a little bit about that. Um, and then finally, just a little bit from our whole COVID-19 study. So uh, I, we hosted the Preterm Birth Initiative hosted um, a learning session last week and Dr. Um, Malcolm John, one of the things he brought up that I wanted to share with the group um, was this um, sort of where are we in history? And I thought it was a good way to sort of um, start this talk by thinking about that we're all in the middle of a chapter in human history uh, being written. Um, it's, it's not a footnote, it's a chapter. Right, and so it's gonna be with us for a long time. And as I mentioned, um, things are changing all the, the time. So uh, when I was trying to find out a, a sort of a, a picture to go with this, um, 
I thought this was pretty apropos in terms of we thought we were coming out of a tunnel and we've gone right back into another tunnel. So it's a very challenging time. We don't know what's on the other side of that tunnel, um, but I know that we're all really committed to, to the journey for sure. So a little context about where we are. Um, obviously, um, things have, have worsened in the United States. The hard part about giving these talks is that um, there's a lot of bad news and there's some good news too, but um, we hope that being evidence-based and, and looking at the data will, will really uh, improve things in terms of at least public health communication and transparency. So we're at a point right now where we're seeing about 100,000 new cases uh, every single day in the United States. We see these increased rates of death. We're now at right between uh, just about every day, it moves between about 1,200 to 2,100 new deaths in the United States every single day. Um, so we certainly haven't um, stayed out of the tunnel. We had hoped, as I, I think, that the vaccinations would really move us towards uh, real change. And after seeing a decrease, uh, we've seen that uptick that I just described. Uh, right now in the United States, as of two days ago, the total vaccination, fully vaccinated both shots rate is at 56%. But one of the reasons we're talking today is really um, those vaccination rates in pregnant people are, are substantially lower. Um, the CDC is now has a dashboard, the, um, the link to the dashboard is below there, that tracks uh, the vaccination rate among pregnant women. And you can see in general that among pregnant women, that vaccination rate is really um, well below 40% and actually below 20% uh, in Black, non-Hispanic pregnant people. Last week, um, the CDC issued a health alert network advisory, um, really, um, I wanna say pushing, that may not be the right, advocating doesn't seem right, pushing doesn't seem right, but, but really trying to increase uh, the rate of vaccinations for pregnant people. You can see uh, the headline from the New York Times and the reason for this is obviously what I just mentioned in terms of the vaccination rate being not particularly where we want it to be. So the vaccination rate in pregnant people as of mid-September was about 31% in terms of those fully vaccinated. Um, there's been more than 125,000 confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 in pregnant people more than 22,000 hospitalizations and 161 deaths in August, as of August, the end of August. Uh, and August actually saw the highest rate uh, number of deaths among pregnant people since the start of the pandemic. And the CDC also noted that more than 97% of the hospitalized pregnant people were unvaccinated. So why are we particularly worried uh, about um, what's happening with pregnant people? Uh, and the toughest part for those of us who uh, monitor this data, think about the data, is how things have changed over time. Uh, I, for this talk and for another one I was giving, I went back and I sort of looked at some of the headlines, which I haven't included here, but, you know, they went from every a year ago that there was no impact of, of SARS-CoV-2 on, on preterm birth or adverse outcomes uh, to continuing sort of back and forth. But in terms of how COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 affects pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women, really the biggest study on that really remains what the CDC published in November where they compared more than 23,000 pregnant people with COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2 to more than 386,000 non-pregnant um, people where they were all symptomatic. And what they found was pregnant individuals were more than th three times as likely to be admitted to the ICU, um, almost three times as likely to be ventilated, 
um, more than twice as likely to be on ECMO and a more than 70% increased risk of death compared to uh, non-pregnant people. So this is really in part fueling the urgency with the CDC, including the low vaccination rates. And we obviously won't be going into this in detail, but just in terms of why this might be, um, what we know, and this has been known for some time with pregnancy uh, and infections. In fact, it was quite surprising when very early in the pandemic, it was suggested that um, pregnant people weren't gonna be uh, at higher risk for, for more severe illness because we know uh, that pregnancy in general is a generalized sort of immunological suppression in response mostly to paternal cells, but into the fetus. So it's very adaptive um, to have a suppressed immune system during pregnancy, but that makes individuals uh, more vulnerable to infections. Uh, we also know that progesterone and estrogen in particular can cause changes in nasal mucosa and other mucosa in the, in the body that both um, make it easier to grab on to um, viruses and harder uh, to clear them. Um, similarly with the respiratory system, especially as you progress in pregnancy and you have um, pressure on your diaphragm, it can also be harder to um, clear infection. Uh, we also know that during pregnancy, because of these issues uh, mentioned above, that um, bacterial and viral co-infection is often um, common uh, and more common than in non-pregnant people uh, for that reason I just described in terms of uh, grabbing onto viruses, keeping them, and having a hard time clearing them. And then we know that there's also uh, more um, uh, leukocytosis, so really high levels of, of white blood cells as the system is trying to fight back infection. Uh, and we also see a lot more hyperinflammation uh, in pregnant people. And, and these tendencies, the leukocytosis and the hyperinflammation have, have actually been reported in studies comparing those with and without COVID-19. So as we move into talking about um, adverse pregnancy outcomes, I wanna provide a little bit of framing, and I know this is a slide with a lot of text, um, but really sort of backing up the clock and thinking about where were we when this all started? So really the first paper uh, looking at um, SARS-CoV-2 infection and pregnancy outcomes was published in spring 2020, focused on nine pregnant people in Wuhan. Um, and they reported a similar clinical course for pregnant people and no increased risk for adverse outcome. In the summer 2020, we started to see larger studies. Uh, we saw um, the uh, paper come out from the New York, in, in New York City, looking at five centers. Now we're looking at 241 cases, uh, and they reported a preterm birth rate of 14.6% overall in those with COVID-19, but really high rates of preterm birth in those that were critically ill. Um, getting into November, we, we saw um, a, an even bigger study come out of Texas uh, where they reported no increased risk for preterm birth or other adverse outcomes. But then finally moving into 2021, we're seeing bigger studies. Not everything is now aligned, but in general, we're seeing much more um, concurrence about the relationship with preterm birth. Um, still some questions out there uh, about other outcomes, um, but uh, really as we've moved into um, the summer 2021, we're seeing the publication of a number of large population-based studies, including hours, which Dr. Karasak will uh, review. But wanted to, to sort of lead with this. There was a good um, systematic review that was published in June, uh, looking across multiple studies from 44 countries. And you can see here that, um, as I mentioned in the, with the green line, um, that's sort of what we're seeing with preterm birth across studies. That's really um, reflected in, in what we're seeing, but in multiple studies, it doesn't mean all studies, but most studies, I mean, you pull across, um, you're really seeing that relationship with preterm birth. Pretty consistent relationships with preeclampsia as well, with uh, risks more than twofold for both preterm birth and preeclampsia when we compare 
um, those with and without um, COVID-19 or, and I should mention, uh, many studies are still case-based and they compare the more critically ill to the asymptomatic. Um, and we see really similar patterns. So it's not just infection with the virus. It also seems to be something with being symptomatic. Um, we're not seeing as consistent findings with fetal loss, although it has been reported in many studies uh, with vaginal compared to C-section. Uh, and what we're seeing in terms of the newborns um, is also a, a little all over the place in terms of how often um, they're positive uh, and how often they end up with the NICU. So there is some evidence that vertical transmission happens sometimes, uh, but not all the time. And that also if infants um, are positive, um, sometimes they're asymptomatic and sometimes they're not. So with that, uh, Dr. Karas, I can send it to you. Thank you, Laura, for that wonderful um, background. And we wanted to spend a little time um, also talking about a recent paper that um, our group published looking specifically at the association of COVID infection in pregnancy with gestational outcomes and preterm birth. And I wanna just note that this paper um, is clearly a joint effort of a large team, both based at UCSF and at other institutions. Um, and this work has really come out of the California Preterm Birth Initiative, which Allison mentioned is where Laura and I um, are both work. And so I just wanted to spend a moment um, talking about the California Preterm Birth Initiative. So we are an institution that's housed within UCSF um, and really have four pillars to our research, um, focusing on racial equity and the inequities that we see in um, birth outcomes and in preterm birth in particular, uh, really focusing on reproductive justice. Um, and so not just um, the healthy pregnancies, but the ability to parent uh, and then the, all the research really centers community voices and tries to take a novel approach um, that engages uh, and centers community. So our mission is to eliminate racial disparities in preterm birth and improve health outcomes for babies that are born too soon through research, partnership, and education grounded in community wisdom. And I also, I'm sure for this audience, I don't need to do a big overview about the importance of preterm birth as an outcome, but I think um, the reason that we focused on preterm birth for this publication in particular is really its importance to population health. So we know that babies um, born preterm have the highest rates of mortality and health problems in infancy on into childhood and even later life. So birth has a long arc and is associated with lower educational attainment and lifetime earnings. And also really interestingly has an intergenerational effect such that if my mother uh, has me preterm, then I myself am more likely to go on and have a preterm birth. So complications from preterm birth were the leading cause of death in children five years and younger globally and account for 16% of all deaths um, and 35% of deaths among um, newborn babies. So I think it's a very important outcome, we can all agree. Um, and it's also likely common knowledge that the United States acts behind other developed nations in our rate of maternal and infant health outcomes. And these inequities have only worsened um, since uh, this picture here through 2013. So what is alarming is there's really persistent and intractable differences in preterm birth by race and ethnicity. Yes. So a black infant born today is twice as likely to be born um, preterm or also low birth weight. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we were already facing these dramatic inequities um, in these outcomes, which are largely the result of structural racism, which has socially earned risk, um, and that we've seen the same sort of uh, population inequities in infection and also access to preventative measures for COVID-19. So I think that's sort of setting the stage um, with where we were in this country going into the pandemic. So we wanted to build on the previous literature, as Laura mentioned, and really capitalize on the fact that um, the state of California added a code to the birth certificates um, to be able to identify COVID infection in pregnancy. 
So we were able to gather birth certificate data um, from July 2020 through January of 2021 at the time that this was published. And we really had four objectives um, with this study. The first uh, was to just examine the prevalence of COVID um, infection and diagnosis in pregnancy um, and see if that was really different um, by uh, race, ethnicity, and SES. Um, we also wanted to examine the association of having a reported COVID diagnosis in pregnancy with very preterm births, which are the births below 32 weeks of gestation. Those babies often have um, the highest rates of morbidities and complications um, with preterm births uh, below 37 weeks. Uh, or with early term births. So those are the 37 and 38 week births that um, themselves tend to have um, slightly elevated risk compared to term births. Um, and then also with subtypes of preterm birth. So whether um, a preterm birth was identified as being spontaneous um, or medically indicated. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we want to examine all the differences by race, race and ethnicity and insurance status as a proxy measure of socioeconomic status. And then because we know that um, comorbidities, particularly hypertension, diabetes, and obesity have been so important um, in terms of determining severity of COVID infection, we also know they're very associated with um, adverse birth outcomes. We wanted to see um, if these comorbidities in pregnancy conferred an additional risk. So as I mentioned, we used um, the California Vital Statistics records from July of 2020 through January of 2021, um, which was the um, time when we acquired the data and started this analysis. That was the most recent month of, of um, the data. So um, importantly, this they included this code in, on the birth certificates, um, but not all hospitals appear to have been reporting it. So we excluded hospitals that did not report any um, COVID-19 diagnoses because we know that over the course of the pandemic, there certainly um, would have been pregnant people that had this diagnosis. Um, and then we also excluded uh, Im implausible gestational ages. So we got to um, a data set with 200, about 240,000 births over this time period. So the exposure was identified as both confirmed and presumptive COVID-19 infection on the birth certificate. And a confirmed infection indicates that a test was confirmed by a CDC laboratory and presumptive indicates a state or local laboratory. So we're looking actually at both of those codes um, because both of them had tests that were uh, confirmed. Uh, and then again, we're looking at these three outcomes primarily very preterm birth below 32 weeks, preterm birth below 37 weeks, and early term birth. And you see that across the whole data set, um, we see about a 3.5% um, prevalence of COVID diagnoses across all of the pregnancies in this time period. So here's part of the table one of the demographics of the population. And I think um, what's really notable here is that we can see differences in infection um, by race, ethnicity, and by socioeconomic status. So I just want to walk you through a couple of these here. So, um, so you can see for the birthing people who identify as Latinx, they make up about 47% of all the births in California. However, they make up 68% of the births that are marked as COVID positive. Um, and that is really in line with what we've seen with COVID infection overall among the Latinx community in California. So similarly, um, if you look at educational attainment as a marker of socioeconomic status, you see that those with less than a high school education are about 10%, uh, comprise about 10% of the births, but almost 20% of the COVID infections. And then um, we are looking at payer for delivery and public insurance is Medicaid or Medi-Cal insurance in California. They make up 40% of the births, so really a large portion of the births in California but then an increasingly disproportionate um, number of the COVID infections in pregnancy, so 56%. Um, none of this is particularly surprising with what we know about COVID infection in pregnancy, um, so, you know, but important to see that it did play out here. So this table um, shows the prevalence of that COVID-19 diagnosis on the birth certificate over time. And importantly, I should have noted that um, the diagnosis could have occurred at any point in pregnancy. So we don't necessarily know 
know that it was at the time of birth, um, but it could have been marked earlier uh, in the person's pregnancy. However, given that there was increased um, prenatal screening at the time of birth, when, uh, when pregnant women came into labor and delivery, they were immediately screened. Um, and so likely that is capturing a large portion um, of these COVID infections. So uh, when we look at the change over time in prevalence of infection, um, we really see this increasing prevalence as the pandemic progresses. Um, this is likely not surprising to anyone. Um, and then, you know, particularly increasing into January where our data set ends, you know, we all know that, <laughs> that it continued to increase in the winter of 2021 um, and certainly in our recent peak with Delta as well. Um, so we do see these um, persistent differences by race, ethnicity, um, and also by insurance status in terms of the prevalence of infection. Um, so the, the gray line here is the overall uh, prevalence of infection, and you can see that consistently for Latinx pregnant people, the prevalence of infection uh, is higher. Um, and also you see these higher rates at the end for um, indigenous and native Hawaiian Pacific Islander uh, pregnant people. And similarly, when we look at um, Medi-Cal insurance, we see that those that have Medi-Cal insurance have a consistently higher prevalence um, of COVID infection compared to the population overall. So uh, we also wanted to examine uh, the prevalence of preterm birth, um, and we can see differences uh, really across the board, across racial ethnic groups and insurance status in um, COVID infection and preterm birth. So you can see here that the orange bars are uh, those that had a reported COVID code, and the red bars are those that did not have a reported COVID code. Um, and so um, you can also see that um, there are some groups that have, you know, a much more dramatic difference um, between the COVID infections um, and those that do not have COVID infections. And then I think what's also very important to note here is that in particular um, for Black pregnant people, we see, you know, much higher uh, persistent rates of preterm birth for both those without with COVID infection and those without. And so it allows you to start to think about sort of the population burden of preterm birth and how COVID might be contributing to that. So these are our um, adjusted models um, of COVID infection in pregnancy and very preterm birth here uh, on the left, preterm birth in the middle and early term birth on the right. Um, so we can see that um, the, we found an elevated risk of very preterm birth with a, a relative risk of 1.6 uh, with COVID infection. Uh, we found a relative risk of 1.4 for preterm birth and then relative risk of 1.1 for early term birth. Um, and you can see that um, the rates of very preterm, preterm and early term were really statistically significantly higher among individuals with COVID-19 across racial ethnic groups. Um, notably, uh, the, the it appeared that for Black people and for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, those relative risks um, were not statistically significantly increased. Um, but I think it's important to note that when we actually looked at uh, effect modification by race, we didn't see evidence of effect modification, largely overlapping confidence intervals here. Um, so I think that the story is really that um, the COVID infection in pregnancy increases the risk of these very important outcomes um, across the board and that there might be important implications for um, differential burden in, in different groups. And we can also see here that um, for those with public insurance, we, we saw slightly higher relative risk, but also um, increased relative risk for those without public insurance as well. So then um, the previous literature had really focused on preterm birth um, that were initiated uh, by providers and largely as Laura uh, reported, because a lot of that work were case studies of um, pregnant people who had very severe maternal illness. And so there's an indication to um, to deliver the infant early and, and le thus leading to preterm birth. So we really wanted to examine differences in indicated and spontaneous preterm birth. So spontaneous preterm birth um, included codes of premature rupture of membranes, premature spontaneous labor with intact membranes, 
um, and so forth on the birth certificate. And then provider initiated preterm birth included those without premature retro membranes or premature labor um, that had a code for uh, artificial rupture of membranes or a cesarean birth. Um, and then also there's a, a large number of um, births on the birth certificate that are not identified as spontaneous or indicated. So we felt that was important to look at as well. Um, so here we really saw overlapping relative risk estimates for both um, indicated and spontaneous and also unknown preterm birth. I think indicating that there may be um, potentially uh, differential pathways um, to provider initiated and also to spontaneous preterm birth with COVID infection in pregnancy. So as I mentioned um, at the beginning, uh, since we know that the comorbidities of obesity, hypertension, and diabetes can lead to additional risks uh, for severity of COVID infection, and also the underlying risk for preterm birth and other adverse outcomes, we wanted to examine this joint relationship of COVID infection and comorbidity on preterm birth. Um, so here in this table, you can see that um, when we compare people who had a COVID infection in pregnancy and either hypertension, diabetes, or obesity, we see um, a, a two and a, about two and a half fold increase in very preterm birth, uh, two fold increase in preterm birth, and a 30% increase in, in early term birth. So really we see this sort of compounding risk for uh, COVID infection and comorbidities in pregnancy. So happy to answer any more questions about the study um, in the discussion section, but I think overall uh, our, our primary findings were that we found this increased prevalence of COVID infection uh, in pregnancy in California over this time period. Um, we saw sort of persistent differences in infections by race and ethnicity and insurance status. Uh, we also saw that COVID infection in pregnancy was associated with a 60% uh, increased risk of very preterm birth which are really the births that um, carry the highest amounts of comorbidities and risk for infants. 40% uh, increased risk of preterm birth and a 10% increased risk of early term birth. We also saw that comorbidities elevated this risk. So there's some very important limitations to this literature um, being birth certificate data. We had no information on the uh, severity of infection and in pregnancy. And as Laura mentioned, there's been a lot of work documenting that severity of infection is highly correlated with um, preterm birth and other adverse outcomes. Um, also, we don't know about the timing of um, COVID infection in pregnancy, and notably that this data is prior to um, the vaccination rollout and also the spread of the Delta variant. Um, in some ways, makes it an interesting sort of historical time point, but um, we know that this might be changing over time. So importantly, our findings have been consistent with some of the larger studies um, that have looked at preterm birth and also other adverse outcomes for um, pregnant people as well. Um, so the Chin study and the Villar study that were both a large cohort in the US and a multinational cohort, um, but it contrasts the Adhikari study that, that Laura mentioned that found no impact. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, that uh, this shouldn't be conflated with the research and really report around the population impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and preterm birth. And I wanted to note um, a paper by Dr. Gemmel here that um, showed that potentially in the United States, there were actually decreases overall um, in preterm birth. And so that's really um, thinking about uh, population impact of multiple mechanisms, um, one of which would be COVID infection itself, which I think uh, the literature very much supports uh, is associated with increases in preterm birth. So, and just wanted to um, also note on a bit more about the inequities. So um, we, we did see inequities in COVID infection by race and ethnicity and insurance status. Um, however, we didn't see evidence of a differential impact or heightened impact of COVID infection itself. Um, I think that this is not surprising given the burden of infection that we know um, exists in black indigenous and other people of color. Um, and this certainly has been pregnant and pregnant people as well, in particular among Latin next pregnant people in California. Um, and really, we know the racial inequities and birth outcomes preexisted the 
the pandemic and may have been augmented by it or and continue to be by it. Um, issues behind these disparities, namely racial capitalism, which is an emerging um, area of literature and structural racism have been further impacted by the pandemic. And so racial capitalism, is, capitalism introduced by Robinson is um, the idea of a racialized exploitation and also capital accumulation are mutually reinforcing. Um, and I think see that these differences in infection that we see may represent neighborhood building level risk um, resulting from historical patterns of inequities um, as it has been demonstrated in many other studies. So where are we now, um, given the evidence from this paper and also emerging evidence, as Laura noted, of, of several other papers that have come out since? Um, I think we see that there's pretty consistent, strong evidence for um, the risks of COVID infection in pregnancy on the pregnant person and also the infant. So um, another study that came out, investigators from UC Irvine found very high rates of ventilation and maternal mortality with COVID infection in pregnancy as well. Um, so we see this really urgent need need for mitigation measures to reduce COVID infection in pregnancy and really protect pregnant people um, as a unique population. Um, obviously, vaccination is our strongest um, preventative measure at this point, um, but I think it's also very important to think about how other policies can protect pregnant people, certainly masking, um, social distancing mandates, um, but also thinking about policies such as protecting sick leave and, and paid family leave for pregnant people um, to allow them to reduce workplace exposures, um, eviction moratoriums, and housing protection. Um, we've seen at least reports of increased evictions um, for pregnant people. We know single mothers face much higher rates of evictions overall um, than the population. So I think it's important to sort of take a, a broader approach to think about all of the mitigation measures. And just to touch a bit on vaccination, um, in pregnancy, uh, folks are likely familiar with the fact that um, the ACOG and Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, and of course the CDC have now all come out with um, strong recommendations for COVID vaccination in pregnancy. Um, this is based on a building body of evidence uh, that the vaccine is safe in pregnancy. It does not lead to miscarriage or other adverse outcomes. And it's also effective um, for pregnant people. However, we see that um, even these strong recommendations and this science hasn't shifted vaccination in pregnant people as much um, as those in public health and medicine might like to see. So we're now at about a 31% um, coverage rate for pregnant people, as Laura mentioned. That, that is increasing, um, but I think it's really important that many of the public health messages around vaccination may be um, seen as paternalistic to pregnant people. Um, and I think it's part of an ongoing conversation to acknowledge um, mistrust uh, in public health and in the medical system as sort of a, a conversation um, to start reapproaching vaccination and really meeting people where they are. Um, as Laura mentioned, she just led a, a um, talk at UCSF around there was really a listening session uh, around vaccination for pregnant people. And one of the emerging themes was that people really need information without judgment and that that's been a barrier um, to having these conversations with providers. Um, so I think that's really an ongoing area that um, if we wanna increase the vaccination rate and also focus on prevention in pregnant people, um, we, we need to be meeting people where they are. So we really wanted to, um end with uh, uh, acknowledging the women uh, and birthing people who are um, choosing to um, move forward with pregnancy right now and are birthing right now. Uh, and I was looking for a picture and I, you know, I, I typed in, you know, um, a bloom at sunrise or at dusk, right? It's a joyful time, uh, but it's hazy. And um, I, I want to introduce you to a study that we're doing. Um, I say at UCSF, but we have lots and lots of collaborators throughout the state of California and more broadly. Uh, and it's called the HOPE COVID-19 study. We refer to it as just HOPE, which is healthy outcomes of pregnancy for everyone. Um, and we are currently, uh, we're still enrolling. Um, there are more than 500 participants from around the country and around the world. 
um, individuals complete surveys at, during pregnancy uh, each trimester and then through 18 months postpartum. Uh, we ask them about um, their health, the health of their infants, but we also do a lot around stress, resilience, and coping. Um, and in uh, the Bay Area, we're, we're also doing a deeper dive looking at uh, immune markers, um, what's happening with the microbiome and, and other factors that may be um, impacted. And I wanted to share just a few findings um, so that we could really center, we've sort of talked about um, birthing people at sort of a population level. So I really wanted to, or we wanted to sort of bring some of those voices back in. And we're looking at a lot of factors, but one of the most meaningful we know for preterm birth is the relationship between anxiety and adverse outcomes. Um, so we know uh, through research that's been done for a very long time um, that anxiety during uh, pregnancy has close ties to preterm birth and especially small for gestational age birth. Um, uh, and the reasons for that, again, are actually fairly robustly studied in terms of, and we all know this from going through stressful times in our own lives, that our immune system can really take a hit. Um, so we know that anxiety can weaken the immune system and makes it harder to fight off infection. Um, but we also know uh, through a lot of research that's been done, especially at UCLA by Chris Dunkel Shedder's group, that all anxiety isn't the same. So really this fear of the unknown and especially um, pregnancy related anxiety, sort of real fears around uh, what the outcome may be for your baby has especially strong links to adverse outcomes and especially preterm birth. Um, but on the upside, we also know that things like anxiety, uh, I mean, exercise and um, therapy, and especially um, cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy can actually reduce in, in the um, experience of anxiety. So there's some hope in terms of looking at anxiety and maybe in those that are coming out higher, being able to do something about it. So in, hope, in the HOPE study, again, we have a lot of different measures, but I just wanted to share with you a little bit from what we have seen around generalized anxiety disorder. So the GAD7, um, and here are some of the examples of what we ask. So we ask if over the past two weeks, um, did they feel you know, nervous, anxious, or on edge, uh, not be able to stop or control worrying or any of these other factors. And we asked if they um, experienced, experienced one or fewer days, several days, most days are all days. And so to just share, um, these are the findings from GAD, the GAD7 in terms of individuals reporting most or all days. And you can see focusing on the, on the two right hand that really um, this disproportionate burden of anxiety that is being felt uh, in pregnant people who are low income versus not low income. And you can see there's been some decreases. Uh, we started to, to make you know, some headway in the January through June period, but we're definitely seeing um, those decreases level out um, and, and um, not as much progress as we would like to see. And the other part we really um, wanted to share a little bit on are, are remembering as we um, work with pregnant people um, that there's also a lot of um, worry around the pandemic. Um, and so these are responses that um, pregnant people reported that they experience most to all of the time. And you can see, for example, the first question is because of COVID-19, I'm worried about not having a support person when I give birth in the hospital. Uh, and you can see that again, we started above 20% in July through December, January through June saw a real decrease in that. And now it's really um, ticked up, especially in participants um, in areas where um, COVID rates are really increasing. Um, same pattern for the second question, because of COVID-19, I felt increased stress about losing a job or decreased family income. Um, this uh, report is not just specific to low income individuals. We're seeing this across socioeconomic groups. And then finally, over the past few weeks, I felt increased stress about myself, my baby, or someone in my family getting infected with COVID-19. Um, similar pattern, again, some rebound January through June, and it's really come back up. 
Oh, I wanted to share a quote with you. And wouldn't you know it, all my little screens are in front of the quote. Let me move it. <laughs> so this is from one of the things we're doing in HOPE. Um, you know, for those of us who are qu more quantitative um, scientists, um, we've used qualitative measures in the past or open text fields. I have to say, and this is just <laughs> anecdotal, but I have never seen a time or a study in which there's more use of those open text box. We're getting so many women and birthing people who are just so mm, connected in terms of wanting to share their experiences. So this is um, the, a, a report from our participant um, last month. Um, and she says, I'm anxious because I tested positive for COVID and I'm not sure what effect that will have on my pregnancy. I'm anxious about having to go to the hospital alone and not being able to have my partner with me. I worry I would be more vulnerable to bullying, coercion, suboptimal medical care by medical staff without my partner with me. So thanks everyone. I just wanna make sure to call out uh, and send gratitude, especially to the preterm birth initiative in California and uh, our executive leadership team, um, Rebecca Bear, who's on the call, who really is our data engine and all things um, big data <laughs> and, and hope. Um, shout out to our, our bigger discovery team, our preterm birth initiative, California uh, community advisory board, uh, the Hope Collaborative, which, as I said, uh, if you go to the, if you go to the, our our hope.ucsf.edu um, site, you'll see is a lot of folks from around the country, and of course to our participants. Um, huge shout out to our funders, Mark and Len Binioff, um, uh, as well as um, funders from the NIH and other institutions. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, th this has been just a wonderful presentation and I can tell by the chat that this is resonating or these topics are resonating a lot with um, uh, participants. So I'm going to um, open uh, the, or the seminar up for questions. Feel free to put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. I think most of you are muted, but um, I think Dino is available to assist with unmuting. And maybe I missed some questions. Laura, I see a question in the chat about um, does the HOPE study include a qualitative component? So I just thought I'd ask Yes, that. it absolutely includes a qualitative component. Um, but I want to couch that in terms of there are a lot of qualitative fields um, that have yielded rich, rich data. Um, but it doesn't, as of yet, include a, an interview or focus group component. Um, there's a whole story about that, about our, our hope being funded by the CDC last year and then not being funded by the CDC. Um, so we're thrilled that we, um, uh, this was, you know, in the prior administration, we still don't know what happened with that grant that went into contract. Um, uh, but we've been thrilled to be able to move forward. But we're we are as everyone is during COVID, we're learning to uh, pivot and get funding as we go. So we hope to add that. So, oh, Allison, I look yeah. like David Page. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It looks like David Page had a question um, about uh, thoughts about uh, whether the problem is maternal, placental, or fetal factors, and I'm not yes. exactly sure. Yeah, yeah which, thank you. Which no. piece? Yeah. I was uh, actually thinking as to whether it's short term in terms of issues like preeclampsia in the latter part of the pregnancy or perhaps long term fetal growth restriction and um, uh, multiple factors that are contributing to it uh, and whether you can really uh, pause it. Uh, the question got away with, from me before I could complete it, so that's why I'm adding to it. Now, I recognize you don't have placental data, but whether you can draw some inferences associated therewith in, in terms of what's going on. I was thinking that some of the population may be uh, nutritional, long-term uh, considerations, and so on. So you have multiple factors nested in that, and how do you begin to pause it? 
uh, thank you for the opportunity. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you both. Thank you. You know, there's some great work being done on placental involvement um, from some of the big studies priority here at UCSF, um, some work uh, at Harvard. Um, all the data that I've seen so far it, it is really pointing to what we already know around preterm birth, which is this hyper-inflammatory state. Um, uh, and some of the, the data on leukocytosis, especially is sort of these pregnancies that are really doing everything to mount an immune response, um, sometimes to multiple infections. So again, um, there have been some great reviews um, as of late that look at um, the whether the woman with COVID, a uh, pregnant person with COVID had other infections. And it was also, it was much more common for pregnant people with COVID to also have other infections. So I think what we're seeing is novel to COVID-19 uh, or SARS-CoV-2, it's really uh, a bad, bad infection uh, and a really hyper-inflammatory state and an inability to, to, to clear the, the virus. Now, some of the placental studies that are coming out may find that it's novel and it's behaving differently, um, but the, most of what I've seen suggests that it's behaving very similarly to, to MERS, et cetera, where you're, you're seeing sort of this infection inflammatory interaction. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, th th uh, thoughts on the long-term implications for the uh, uh, infant? Uh, into the life course? Yeah, I, I think obviously our biggest concern is preterm birth, right? So oh. um, really not starting uh, their lives in a way that we, we want them to and that their parents would prefer. Um, but we're also looking at, and others are, you know, we, we, there will likely, and it goes well beyond those who've had mothers that were infected, um, there are going to be some developmental patterns uh, around sort of more social isolation, um, neurodevelopmental um, impacts. And there may be, be actually some resilience that we don't expect for, for kids that, you know, got a lot, a lot of attention early on at, at home from parents. So I think we just have to track that over time. And we have to remember, just like with pregnant women, um, that the impacts go are pandemic wide, they're not specific to those with an infection. Um, so we're looking at that and, and others will be interesting to see for sure. Thank you. Sorry, Deb, is there? <laughs> oh, I, I think that's... you wanna add anything? No, I think that's absolutely a great response. I mean, I will just say that it, it seems like thankfully that vertical trans itself may not be um, a primary mechanism in terms of uh, impacts for the infant, but I agree with Laura that preterm birth and associated other outcomes that we know carry, um, you know, life course implications and certainly um, the other effects of the pandemic as we're seeing, especially even for, you know, younger and school-aged children um, are very important. Um, I see two, yeah, thank you. Um, I see two questions in the chat and I'm gonna lump them together. So one is what would be the biggest concept um, that you would want the public to know from all of this? And then the third was, I, or the second was, I would like to ask, has there been thought about policy recommendations or community partnership recommendations to encourage black pregnant chest feeding persons to take the vaccine? Deb, why don't I take one? And number two is absolutely teed up for you <laughs> for the policy implications. So I would say in terms of the most important takeaway, um, it was, it was sort of, we, we kind of buried it in there because there was a lot to get through. But I think right now at this time, the most important message that we can put forth from a public health point of view is um, this issue of meeting people where they are in terms of the vaccine. Uh, we did this, we had this listening session with community uh, last week and um, there is um, still lower vaccine rates than we would like. And it's a public health failure. It's not a failure of pregnant people. It's not a failure of, of families. It's not a failure of communities. It's really 
um, meeting people where they are in a non-judgmental way and having those conversations over and over again. Um, what we heard in these listening sessions were so much bullying, so much um, um, shaming uh, that it has um, caused a number of individuals who are very focused on their health and their family to really um, pause and not and and sort of exasperate existing trauma and violence in those communities. So that would be the biggest uh, takeaway and message I would want to put forward. Deb, do you want to take yeah, that? Please. Yeah, I mean, I think that ties into the policy recommendations as well. I mean, I think we've seen these policies come um, down through the large, um, you know, OBGYN organizations and the CDC, which are certainly moving the needle. We need to get people this information and also um, provide an avenue for people to ask questions. There's so much, as we all know, misinformation that I think persists around um, the vaccine. And sometimes it wasn't misinformation. It was just like a lack of information um, early on in the pandemic with pregnant people not being included um, in the trials, et cetera. So I think really being able to, to, to listen um, to where people are um, and what information they need to make an informed choice. And then also to talk about other um, mitigation measures as well so that pregnant people aren't left feeling like you know, this is the only thing I can do, although we know it's certainly the most effective, but um, that, you know, there's there's other things we can be pushed forward. Okay, great. I think we have three more minutes. So if anybody has a last minute burning question, either in the chat or otherwise. No, I, I had a question about the um, the low vaccination rates for pregnant women. Um, and, and part of this comes from personal experience. Um, I just, uh, my granddaughter was recently born three weeks ago and my son and his wife went through a lot of consternation about thinking whether or not she should get the vaccination and asked me to send her articles. And what, to what extent do you think that the delay in OBGYN providers and the professional groups in not making recommendations or not suggesting that the vaccination was important or at least safe for pregnant women uh, might have had on the low vaccination rates. Because I know she had a lot of trouble deciding and decided back in March when she got the first, um, uh, I think she got Pfizer vaccine, uh, that in fact, this was a difficult decision for them. And so what you're seeing maybe is retrospectively low rates. Do you think you might see a change now that the guidelines have come in and suggested sort of more positive approach to the vaccination? Yeah, you want to take it or you want me to? You can go ahead. Um, it's not that I have a great answer. So um, I think the answer really, the only answer is we hope so. Uh, but, but really it's not just at the ACOG level, it's at the hospital and provider level. Right. Uh, we still see now some providers at the best, <laughs> at supposedly the best institutions who are saying, well, you may want to wait and not get it in the first trimester. And there's actually no data suggests that there's a reason to wait. Um, but you still have providers sort of, um, just making recommendations that are not evidence-based. So um, this is the public health, fit, one of the key parts of the public health failure, um, which is um, providers having the information at hand to, to make recommendations to, to um, their patients, but at the same time, needing counseling way beyond why it's safe, but around how to listen and have that feedback loop um, and so I think those two things are going to have to happen, right? Better evidence base, um, communication, and, and sort of both at the national and at the hospital level, but at the same time, um, training around how to, how to have those conversations uh, in sort of a feedback loop, as opposed to you need to get vaccinated as I tell you to get vaccinated. So, so hearing women's voices, basically, which yep. is what we talk about all the time. Yep. 
yeah. is really critical for maternal health and newborn health. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Very, very yeah. interesting presentation. Great. Thanks, everybody. Great. I actually got the time wrong. So what anybody last minute burning questions, but or <laughs> any comments? Um, And I, I do want to say, for those that don't know Devin and myself, the fact that we did this on time is a miracle in and of itself. So we want to thank you. Whatever it was, we managed to stay on time. <laughs> so it was a miracle. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, there's lots more work to do on this topic. Um, so you heard that I'm doing work, of course, Deb and Laura. So feel free to reach out to us if you're interested. And uh, we look forward to seeing where this research field goes. It's really exciting and um, important. So thank you everybody for joining us. Hope you have a good rest of your week. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation.